Right, good evening everybody. Thank you very much for popping along and spending a short time of your evening with me. Uh, I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I originate from Lincolnshire. I came down here 33 years ago. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to be involved in most parts of watergrass growing right from seed all the way up to harvest. Yeah, I spent a bit of time over doing things in Portugal, uh, had a little bit of time from time to time in America, um, being uh, our partners out there who supply us watergrass in the winter, but um, not so much now because we tend to get most of our stuff from uh, Portugal. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I've been here 33 years. I was brought down here from Lincolnshire, basically. Uh, my experience was in modular growing brassicas and there was a movement to require a better modular grown seedling in watercress. So I spent my first two years developing a slightly different system. The system was there, but um, we, yeah, there was a few things wrong with it. Um, luckily we got it right. And most of what we do still with propagation is uh, currently being used today. So we'll start off with a bit of watercress history as regards watercress growing, and then I'll move on to the development over basically 50 years of harvesting watercress. So these are a few old pictures which I was kindly sent by Andy Roberts who worked for us. And here on the, on the left hand side, this is um, just planting watercress in the bed. In them days, the plants were grown from seed. So the bed was pretty much prepared the same as what we do today. But when they did the seeding, uh, from raw seed, they used to put strings across, which used to stop the the uh, seed floating down and out out of the beds. And then when they grow grew and um, they started to root, um, they grow to a seedling stage, and then to a slightly much more mature plant, and then they were pulled and thinned out, and the rest of the bed was planted with it all. What well, sometimes would happen if there was a lot of material, they would take those and plant those in another bed and start, start the process that way. This here is the start of cropping and clearing. Well, what, what they used to do when they was harvesting is, is gather it and trim it. And then they uh, used to pull it by hand, which I've got a little bit of video to show you in a moment, um, and then trim it off and then put it into the box and then it used to go off to the pack house. Okay, again here, we've got a um, bunch harvesting and on the other side also. So that was the process. Is It was a back-breaking job. Um, I did a little bit when I first came to the company 33 years ago. One of the intriguing things is when it's been cold in the mornings and the frost has gone off the crop, we used to go in there and hand harvest. And some of the guys used to get an enormous amount of press in their hand turn it to one side and slice the roots off uh, to make it a little bit easier for them to bunch in the pack house. The time you can know you got it wrong uh, because your hands was cold, um, you used to slice and then if the crest turned red, you knew you had sort of not quite got it right. Yeah, it was a back-breaking job. Uh, it was a good job. It, it disappeared in a way. Nowadays, it's all machine harvested. I know there's an awful lot of older people like myself and older, they'll probably want to buy bunch of watercress and there is a still still a few small growers out there doing it. So um, again here, we've got a bit updated photograph, obviously. Uh, this was at the St. Marybourne site, I think. Once they harvested the cress, trimmed them, and um, it was put on a small trailer and tractor and trailer and taken to the bunch shed for the women to the bunch. The core of the business remains watercress, and amongst the company's oldest beds are those in Dorset. Based around Bear Regis and Spetsbury, some 70,000 square metres of watercress are farmed under Silver Springs Watercress Limited. Despite increasing mechanisation, many of the old skills are still employed in Silver Springs, including hand cutting for bunched cress, which forms the core of their business with an output which can exceed 160,000 bunches per week. 
anyway, there's an old chap here. Um, I thought of, I did this quite a while ago, actually. I did the process. Um, again, the first one is gathering, and then the bunch is held together with the roots out. Then the knife there trims the bottom, and basically it should finish up like that. And hopefully, like I said, it doesn't turn red because you get it wrong. And then it's put into a box and then goes to the bunch shed. The next move really was with a machine, which is called a hobby. And that's the machine there. And basically um, there's a man with a fork who would walk at the side of the hobby while the machine cut it. And the fork used to go in and uh, gather the crest. It was quite a, a job to, in the initial stages when I started to do it, was um, to get the right speed with the guy with the hobby. Um, if you got in front of him, you generally picked up the rooted stuff in front when you lifted your fork. And if you got too far behind it, it used to fall over before you got it on the fork. But I did smile to myself when I put this one on because of the uh, health and safety exhaust, which has been put, putting the smoke up there out the way of the operator. But, uh, and then it would be gathered off the fork, in this case, and put straight into the bin. Whereas uh, I remember doing it, uh, same with a fork, but then we used to turn a fork uh, because it was obviously cut off and straight into the bin, and then again straight to the pack house. Obviously, after bunch press, uh, harvestable press, they went, went into doing packs, pre-pack um, watercress, and they needed to harvest it quicker and cleaner and leave the, the, the rest of the material in the bed. So in 1974-75, they started number one, and there was a combination of learning really i guess at that stage and then obviously it progressed to number two which is a similar sort of thing but a, a little bit more advanced it's got uh, the same sort of setup as that but it's more mobile it's more um, a unit to drive itself whereas i think this one had to be pushed then we go to number three which is now we're in now 1978 and they started to have the unit a cutting unit based around a Kubota tractor. And along here was the reciprocating blade, which used to cut the crest as it drove forward. And as you can see here, there's fans on the back, what used to suck it past the driver each side and uh, go into the bins below. And so that was quite a step forward, I would think, at the time. And I did actually use some of these, but not three and four. I came a little bit later and these were still around. Um, I believe Andy told me that, I think it's this one, which was built, was very well made, but it didn't work very well because of the, the way the fans were at the back. Not quite sure whether it's this one or, or one further down the line. They used to have to have a stick man, they called him, and the, the crest used to often get stuck on the blade, and this guy here with the stick used to um, push it past the blade and straight up the air ducts. Carried on being developed a similar way until they decided that they needed something bigger. And this is one of the first units which was built when it used to be cut. I think it worked between two belts there and then taken up at the back and then into the bin. Um, he said the only problem with this one was you had to stand up all the time and look down. So I don't think it was the most practical piece of engineering at the time, but it worked, I think, until they come along to Mark 8, as they called it, and that was at 88, and that was just before I joined in 1990. So this one was a little bit more, and the paddles just helped it once it was cut onto the belt and through the machine and into the bins at the back. Mark 9 was built in our workshops um, at St. Marybourne. It, got, it was too heavy at one stage, so they decided to drill holes in a lot of the steel work to, to make it lighter so it would go on to the vehicles it was transported with. Um, I don't think Mark 9 lasted too long. I think they needed to move forward and then um, the prototype of the Morrish, which is where we are at, at today, but this was the first prototype which they used. This was at the Abbotsham site. And again, this is um, 
one of the first that I would think with a bandsaw blade. And so when it dries forward, it automatically goes onto the belt, which is going backwards all the time and straight into the bin. This one was 2008. As you can see, Andy's now sat, sat on the machine there and he did 50 years of service with us. I took this photograph of him because this is the bed he started in when he first could join the company 50 years ago. And we thought it'd be apt that he had a photograph on the machine 50 years from his starting date. Anyway, we move forward. Again, we're talking about Moorish harvesters here. Um, this is one we still use at Abbott's Hand, strangely enough. These are the latest two harvesting machines. Again, we've got things like chains or chains and that sort of thing to disturb the insects on the front. We've got an irrigation bar should the crest get dry. It's very awkward to cut when it's dry. Um, so that's why we harvest early in the mornings um, because it's a lot easier to cut the crop. Um, this is a bouncing belt here, just shake the bugs off and straight into the bin. And then the bins are then transported to St. Mary Bourne to the pack house. And this one's got a roof on it, which is rather posh. But yeah, they're all built pretty much on the same sort of basis. Um, Morris, you've done a reasonable job. This one uh, has got a central hydraulic platform, which pushes it down into the ground at the end. And then you can move one of these levers here and it'll, it'll spin you around uh, instead of actually uh, destroying the stool, which is left basically. Um, one of the reasons I think that was happening because these tracks are a little bit longer on this model and the turning ability of it is is a lot less and so then we come on to last year's model i don't know whether this one's actually got a, a pivot in the middle where where it comes down and revolves around i don't think it does because it looks as though so those tracks are slightly short, shorter but it works on the same process and they've obviously added, added a few more features, uh, emergency stops, as I call these now, baby bars, because of health and safety. That's virtually up to date with the development of harvesting. So I'll go off the harvesting now and to the watercress production. Well, this is the Abbott's Hand site, which I've been around for quite a while. And the Pill Hill Brook, which is a chalk stream, as you all know, runs down the side of there. We have had things like irrigation, um, which uh, goes on to the crop if it dries out. I'm going to start the process of growing a better watercress by the, the cleaning out, which you'll see in the next slide. To achieve a maximum yield per square metre, it's crucial to have a good bed level. And that means uh, the water running from the top of the bed where the water enters to where it exits at the bottom. If you can avoid the highs and lows in your bed, that's very, very advantageous. And we apply a base dressing um, for that area before we do a planting. The top two is when we, we clear out the bed. Um, the tractor takes, us, takes the remaining crop out and we dispose of that. And then the beds wash down and then it will finish up like it is underneath the trailer. Then we need to put a little bit more gravel back into the bed so we can level the bed. Um, this development here is a, a trailer which I, I made with an hydraulic back door and basically scatters the gravel in the places we need while the tractor driver can do all this from the cab. And uh, he goes down the bed and deposits some gravel where he thinks it's a bit lower. And um, when he fin finishes up with the next process, so all the gravel should be in relatively in the same place. Right, now we come on to the, the bed levelling. But I'm very, very lucky. I've got a gentleman who levels by eye. The guy who levels for me it does a tremendous job. Um, he's, he's been doing it 20, 20 odd years now and they've perfected it to a real art. I developed the laser leveler, which has a base unit and it sort of, we're able to set it. So it does a, a slope from bottom to top. And so that's the way we go. As you can see where the bed's been leveled here. And uh, should you be you know, a little bit short of gravel somewhere, then there's always the bucket on the tractor. 
and then go over it with the yaw rake again. Once we've got the bed level, uh, we need to plant it. All the plants are grown in propagation, which is now down at our Runcton site down in Chichester. I basically developed the tray we use now. One of the things they did change a few years ago was they, they put them on legs, whereas I had a flat tray when I first designed it. And we used to, to air prune them. That's basically what it does. So when the plant gets to the bottom of the tray, the roots decide to come back inside the tray. So it becomes a root ball on the bottom of a module. And they all hold together. We use peat-free material for this operation. Once the trays are filled with compost, they go through a seeding machine, which we try and aim for 12 to 15 seeds per cell. A lot depends on how much seed you put in there because of the quality of the seed. And going to the seed, where most of that's produced out in Portugal. Uh, I used to do it a lot when I first joined the company. It's the most horrible job you could ever believe with the dust and everything else. Uh, I spent my first three, four weeks in Portugal once when I first joined the company cleaning the seed with a, believe it or not, an office fan with me with a jug of material scattered in front of the fan and the light material goes further. The sand, which is mixed in when it's harvested, because obviously there's soil out there um, where we grow it, it's quite sandy. That drops first, the seed drops second, and the husk drops the furthest away, basically. And then it's a case of um, shoveling up the, the different heaps, really. I did in excess of three and a half tonne the first year I was there. Very hot, very sweaty, working in temperatures of 120 degrees in the shed. And I had a manager there who thought that dinner time was two hours, three hours. And so I spent an awful lot of time in my first week, not knowing that I'd done the afternoon because I was so drunk. But anyway, we got through the, the process and we got there. If you've got good quality seed, you obviously use slightly less. If you've got really bad, poor seed, it can cause a lot of problems with uh, disease in the, in the modules, generally. At this stage, they're quite susceptible to that sort of thing. But the Runcton site now do it reasonably well. And so uh, we're quite happy at this, this moment in time. These are the modules. Uh, as you can see, the roots have got to the bottom and they work the way back inside the compost. As you can see, um, yeah, there's about 12 to 15 seeds and uh, plants in those. Like I say, some of these seedlings once they're in the bed will naturally go away because they're not strong enough to survive. Right so once we've got the bed prepared and we've got the plants grown they're delivered to the sites various sites around Hampshire and Dorset. This is one of the planters I developed we've got a number of it's a bit like the harvesters really they they've evolved with what we do the plants are put on in the in a bin on the front and there's a person either side and they take the plants. The bins have got a certain area of material in that bin. Um, so we know how far or it should how far it should go. The driver walks backwards, and I think I've just about done a million miles backwards over the 33 years. So the two guys do work do the work on the outside, uh, the other one walks backwards, and generally um it does a very good job. And so it's there's a belt inside the hopper here. It goes back, there's a brush inside there and that spins them and then lays them out. And I'll just show you. Right, this is a, this is a full process of what I've just talked through. So level in the bed, the bed's level, fertilized, bed's planted. And obviously this one's um, back out of the bed now. But as you can see, uh, the modules are all in place and then we start the growing process. Another one of the modules actually in the bed. The way to describe this, or I've always described it, the planting, is randomly, randomly even. Uh, and as you can see, there's a, a nice even coverage of modules over the beds. I've used this process uh, for the last 30 odd years, so... Um, uh, it, and it and was pretty much still doing the same, but obviously nowadays we use peat-free material to grow them 
seedlings in. Water control for the crop. Um, this, these are the pump houses. The bores go down around 200 feet, so they get clear spring water. And that's brought up to the top and services the two carriers which are there. And then that's introduced into the bed by these hatch boards. A lot of people have come along and said, isn't there another a better sophisticated way of putting water in water water rest beds? No, is the answer. Uh, it's sort of something a bit individual as regards every farm manager has his own way of uh, introducing his water through his hatch board, really. Generally here, we, we it's the size of the stone what lifts that board up from the bottom. And um, then it's a judgment by the uh, manager or whoever's doing the water to make sure they don't get too much in, because if they do, it'll wash the modules away. So it's a case of, as the crop grows, you increase the water. From this point, uh, it's important, again, not to have too much water, just to supply what you require. As time's gone on, um, cost of doing modules is quite expensive. And so when the time's right and the weather's conditions allow, I've developed a, a bit of a way of doing direct sown. These seedlings here, they've probably been grown for two to three weeks. Whereas in a module, they'll grow quickly within 10 or 12 days and then the modules are planted out. But at this time of the year, and this is the crop which I've actually taken a picture of, I think it's around three, three, four weeks. Well, the modules would be quite a lot bigger than that, um, should they be grown uh, under cover and in a warmer climate in the, in the greenhouse. So this is a, another process, but what you don't have with this process is that you don't have the material from the modules. You don't put any... Um, material as regards peat or peat free material into the bed. So that's a, that's a good thing for us, but it uh, takes a little bit longer to grow the crop from seed. So what we've got here is a cedar, which uh, again, I um, purchased from somewhere. Uh, it's just a, basically a lawn cedar, a lawn fertilizer, sorry. Because the seed is very small, um, there's two and a half thousand seeds per gram. It's very hard to, get down low enough with the aperture to let the right amount of seed go in. So what I tend to do with this, I bulk it, bulk it up a little bit with sand. I use dry kiln sand because it's it's the same as the seed. It's very dry. It flows. It's very flowable. And so I mix a, a proportion of seed for the bed with the sand, uh, put it in the hoppers and walk up and down. And to be honest, we can sow a bed as quick as we can plant it. But the bed before we sow is prepared exactly the same as what we would do for the modules. But after it's been prepared, I ring roll it. I then sow it and then I ring roll the seed in. And then that seems to trap the seed in the gravel. And even if we get a, a storm or anything like that, you know, it doesn't disturb what I've sown. Um, I've not experienced it. I've been doing it about five or six years now and we've been quite successful with it, and it's certainly reduced the cost of what, what we grow. This one was sown, like I said, two, two or three, four weeks ago, and it's just coming through, and then it's at this stage. As I say, we put a little bit of fertiliser on afterwards just to support the crop. Um, what I do at Abbotsand to make sure we don't get any runoff or li limit the runoff is that I drop all the water out of the bed, and basically the bed's relatively dry when I put the fertilizers on. We want the fertilizer in the bed, not down the, down the stream, obviously. As it grows, we increase the water. Depending on what time of the year it is from modules, it's about four to five weeks from sort of May time onwards, May, June on time, time onwards. Um, if, it's, if they're planted earlier, like February, then you're talking of eight, sometimes nine, depending on how the British weather treats us. But as you can see, that's what we want. The finished product is, is a level bed. Once we've got a bed like that, generally you should be cutting, you know, a kilo per square metre, really. So if this, this is around a 450 metre bed, and so you would expect to get 450 kilo off. Sometimes you can get more, sometimes you can get less, depending on 
what specification the factory you want um, as regards uh, salad cress or standard cress. This is the harvester we use. We, we have a plastic liner, the, bit, the cress goes into the, the bin and then it goes off to the cooled and then to the packing plant. Process of the crop, me cutting, uh, then this is behind the driver before it goes into the bin and then into the bin. Obviously, we have a seeding program or a um, seedling program, sorry, throughout the year. The crop has a natural flowering period, which is sort of June to July, again, depending on the weather and depending on the crop itself, whether it's under a bit of stress, tends to go to flower. Yeah, the pack house don't particularly like flowers. Um, the flowers won't hurt you, um, they're quite edible but it's not a thing that we want to be sending unless we're, it's absolutely necessary. And there's some sophisticated optical sorters which do take things like that away. When we start to return stubbles, so this is a harvested crop, we first go in with this um, a day or so or a couple of days afterwards with a, a chipper which has got a flail head on and that basically takes the volume of material slightly down and that leaves leaves the bed level and then probably a week later we'd go back in because it starts to regenerate itself and while this machine is quite good there's areas of the crop which doesn't get cut by this because it gets run down by the the front wheels of the machine and they pop up and so you go in with a second chipper which these blades here, uh, a bit like a flymo really. Um, this is another one which we, we got designed and got built. Uh, works very well. We used to have an older version of this and it had so many belts on, it was crazy. And so we've reduced the mechanical moving parts of it down to just moving the heads and then up and down for the height of what we want to chip. And then there's a speed control on here. It's a two geared machine. It's one of those jobs which I feel from my time at Rowan Watercress, uh, if you go too quick, it doesn't really do a very good job. So it's quite a relaxing process. Um, if you like walking up and down. Yeah, there's always a, a bit of disruption at the end of the bed, which this, the crop was cut by the harvester. Um, so we sometimes patch it up depending on the time of the year or if you go careful with the harvester, you don't really destroy anything and it generally sorts itself out. So once it's been done like that, sometimes you go in for a second one with this, with this chipper, but it's not always, depending on how quick you, you want it to return. And then this is a return stubble. So you can see it comes back quite level. So this is like a second crop. Um, so you've basically regen regenerated a, a harvested stubble um, trimmed it down with that, that left like that, and maybe at the right time of the year, two to three weeks later, you get that. So again, you can go in with a harvester, and yeah, it's a, obviously a cheaper way than taking all the material out, washing the beds down, regraveling, planting with more material, you know, with more seedlings. Um, and so yeah, at this time of the year, it's obviously a, a, a cheaper process.
uh, actually this was originally my hawk um i've been i used to fly by him for about 10 or 12 years this one was actually called danny um unfortunately he's not around anymore we try and use natural deterrence um purely because it's it, it works well with our environmental policies that we try and uh, scare the birds we're not there to particularly harm them uh, but we don't uh, things like ducks and Pigeons is our main problem uh, on the crop because they, they tend to peck them and destroy the, the leaf shape and it doesn't look great in a pack. So we try and deter the, the bird life off the crops as much as we can, but we try and do it as easy as using the birds, really. Uh, we Currently, we've we've got another hawk guy on uh, Abbotsan. He comes in two or three times a week and flies his hawks around. Yeah, the pigeons tend to take notice. So it's a, it's a good process. Other things we've done to stop um, animals and so forth. So we've got a deer fence all around our sites. Well, to be honest, I didn't see that many deers on Abbotsand before we had the fence put in. But it's another deterrent, obviously, for, for things like, I would say foxes, but foxes are very clever because they climb up the rabbit wire and they get through and they can squeeze through these squares. So um, it's not always the a deterrent what you might think and down the bottom we have a, a rabbit netting which is dug into the ground the life fence i'm sure you're going to go what's it got a life fence now it wasn't to keep the workers in certain times of the year well at the beginning of the year more 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 or less is um, we have problems with frogs and toads and so we put a low voltage it's only a small battery which puts a um, current through the a low lying wire if they touch it, it doesn't hurt them, but it gives them a, a little bit of a knock and they walk back into the stream, amazingly. Right, I've got another array of deterrents. Obviously, the kite, this is the pole, the kites go on the pole. They look like hawks, not to us, but hopefully to the, to the birds. Unfortunately, the birds get very uh, accustomed to them very quickly, and so they don't always work that well. So it's it's a good policy to keep taking them up and down every three or four days or moving them uh, again this is an, another one uh, when the wind blows they work very well when the wind's not so um, strong then they tend to hang on the pole really and don't really do that much uh, other things i've sort of gathered in my armory uh, one of the old football rattles uh, that works quite well and this is the starter gun which uses blank um, shot sorry it's quite good again because it, it just startles the birds and then this is used for persistent ducks which won't move um it's always good to put a bit of 10 mil shingle in put it in there and scatter it over the top it doesn't hurt the ducks we don't particularly aim at the duck so it's just something else what startles them and they fly away uh, obviously we've got other things like the the gas guns but i use those not to annoy the neighbors we tend to do it very 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 cautiously when the pigeons are persistent then we have to use them slightly more than we we would like at times but generally if i don't need to use them then i don't i'm sure you're all aware that watercress is quite versatile as regards into cooking quiches etc these scones were made um i had a visit from the local village shop they had a, a day with me and i took them on a tour of the farm they did their, uh, I think it was 20 years of the shop opening. Uh, I've got a good, very good relationship with the people in the village and um, village shop. It's run by volunteers. They love doing things like this. And I invited them down because they wanted somewhere to sort of celebrate their 20 years of being open. The other thing what's been an addition, which is quite nice, is uh, infused gin with watercress. It's quite good. It has a lovely taste. and. Uh, yeah, the crest which infuses it does come from the other sand part. Other things which is obviously you all know, pickle and, and watercress and marmite and watercress. And obviously I haven't got a picture of it, but I thought you would all work it out if you're choosing watercress. We'll go to the environment now. Uh, another aerial view of Abbotsan from the other end. Uh, again, this is Bill Hillbrook down here. The site's actually changed from when I took this. Um, these tunnels are not here anymore. 
basically all the way from there, all the way to the bungalow at the end, is a long wild flower strip. We've got some beehives here about 20 or 30 through the season, which uh, absolutely love our wildflower area. And uh, it's all done through Becky's Bees, who's a local company. They do all the husbandry with the bees. It sort of works in well with our current situation of Bidecrest Farm Excellence. Right, going on to Bidecrest Farm Excellence, uh, we're in our third year of the Bidecrest Farm Excellence Programme. As I say, it's a bespoke conservation farming scheme which promotes and delivers positive outcomes for biodiversity on all our farms. We all do different things on different sites. I've been doing an awful lot of um, stuff prior this, uh, but we're doing it in a different way now where we do, sorry, all the monitoring is recorded now, river sampling, etc. as I'll show you as I go through this presentation. So yeah, the, com the company is very uh, environmentally aware and we're, we're actively always doing something with wildlife habitat projects. Right, here at Abbot's Hand, um, um, we have bat nights where we've been around with people with bat detectors and in the earlier days we've installed quite a lot of bat boxes around the spinney at the end of the farm and more to come as the process carries on. And yeah, there's usually, um, we've detected sort of five different types of bats present on the site. Yeah, there's two uh, pipistrels, uh, the doorbell and bats, which obviously skim across the water. All these I see on a regular basis um, around the site as the, the night comes in. Got chills and long-eared bats. So that's, that's the five bats we tend to have around on the sites. Let's go bioacoustics first. Um, we've recently began through the farm excellence. Uh, we've had bioacoustic units uh, around most of our farms for around three months. They've been downloaded, been sent away back and downloaded. And we've got an amazing amount of uh, recordings. I haven't got the, the details with me at the moment. It would take too long to go through. But, um, They've been an excellent asset. Uh, we've done birds and bats. So the, the green ones, I believe, with birds and the blue boxes were bats. Yeah, they proved to be what we've sort of recorded before, but um, there's been some you know different ones as well. It records every time something sings, basically, uh, and then it's downloaded and analyzed from there. I think also what's planned is to do the insects as well and i believe they record on the sound of the uh, wing beats i believe and then river sampling i'm very lucky uh, with both of these um, items i have some great volunteers who come and monitor the river for the invertebrates they uh, religiously come once a month they've now taken on not only the birds once a month but they they now do water samples for me and they're doing a terrific job and everything's recorded but no it works very well they do a cracking job uh, long may it continue we have a great array of birds we're overwhelmed really and it's great to see a lot of them you don't see them very regularly but you see them from flashes of this that and the other obviously the red kites are around quite a lot um sparrowhawks Okay, you know, not so regular, but the kestrel tends to nest at Abbotstown every year, um, and the owls we hear and see from time to time on the site. And talking of the sparrowhawk, just a little quick story. I went down to the bottom, and there was this little bird sat on the ground, not looking the happiest. I realised what it was. Uh, I went back home. I got a landing net because I thought it might fly away, but it. It obviously had fallen out of the nest. So I um, went back down, caught it. Uh, I took it to the Hawk Conservancy. Uh, Matt Stevens from the Hawk Conservancy brought it back. When he brought it back, he said, it's far better if it's down here than what we can do with it at this stage at that age. And we went back down where I found it, put it on a rather sturdy branch and then got his phone out and I thought what's happening here anyway he played a recording of the parents noise um call 
And amazingly, very, very quickly, the adults had come back and was looking down at the chick on the branch. So we, we skipped out the way and uh, hopefully everything sorted itself out after that. Every farm's got barn owl boxes. Uh, we've had a lot of success at the Mullins farm um, and also at the St. Marigold site. I've had a bar, um, owl box up a long while, a barn owl box, but I've not been so lucky. But we do have the barn owls down at Abbotstown. Some mornings when we're just about to get ready to go out with the tractors, etc., we see a barn owl quartering our wildflower land. It's all looking quite positive on the barn owl scene. We do a, a big area of wildflowers and habitats for bumblebees and birds and, and butterflies. And that's all grown up now. And so that's uh, managed now as a habitat. Uh, there's a grand old gentleman there. I'm not quite sure whether I'm holding the um, bugger hotel up or it's holding me up. But yeah, we installed this at the start of the year. It was built by a very, very talented guy at our Mullins farm, Richard. Uh, it's all made out of recycled material. We've got a larger one over at the Mullins farm where he works, which has got quite a lot of activity in. But uh, as you can see, it's, um, it's quite a magnificent piece of engineering. Right, there's one of the areas of wildflowers. We tend to go to um, Cotswold Seeds. They're, they're very good at doing this sort of mix. It seems to work very well for us. So all the way up to the bungalow, uh, it, all the way there. And where I'm stood behind me is a, a similar area, which goes sort of when you looked at the overall picture of Abbotstown, where the tunnels were, it goes as far as where the tunnels were. So we've got a, quite a massive area now uh, and it works tremendously well. And they go on to be bird food as well for the winter. And so I don't really do anything with it apart from obviously the flower heads disappear, it goes to seed, um, but I don't really touch it until February, March, where I may mow it off and then it regenerates. This is a two year mix. Uh, we've got obviously the butterflies, etc. They, they They go absolutely mad. Right, we'll go on to kingfishers now, which we seem to be quite, quite pleased to see most days, to be honest. Um, I've, I've, one nearly landed on the tractor bonnet the other day. I'm not quite sure whether we wanted to try it or not. But um, yeah, I've installed a kingfisher nest, nest box on, on the river, which actually I think I'm going to move because I don't think I, I, I got it right in the right place. These guys we see very regularly. The pleasing thing about this is that if the river system doesn't work, um, if we don't get plenty of invertebrates, uh, then the fish don't survive, and then if the fish don't survive, the otters don't survive, and uh, it's all part of the ecosystem, really. This one, uh, as you'll see a video later, um, it had uh, been quite busy, and this was a daytime busy, and uh, again, it spent uh, a quite a bit of time at the farm, didn't seem to be too worried about people, and uh, I think it had worn itself out. So it went to sleep into, into the undergrowth at the side of the stream. And uh, again, my partner was very, very, very good to get in there with the camera and take these wonderful pictures. Right, other things which we've got is obviously water voles. So there's quite a population. Uh, we've done a population survey. We Unfortunately, it's very hard to video them, even with the even with the cameras. Um, by the time the cameras sort of set itself off, this one speeded across the the stream and plopped away. Um, so we we don't see them too often, um, only for a brief second. But yeah, we've got quite a few water voles kicking around. As regards, yeah, we monitor the invertebrates in the stream. We do kick samples. It's all on the national database. Um, and obviously we've got not too many grayling. Uh, the couple of mayfly here. Um, I did question Sophie. I'm not quite sure why this one's got two, two bits missing, but maybe he's been close to a fish. Uh, the volunteers are excellent. Uh, they come down once a month and do these. Uh, I believe one of them is actually going on a invertebrate course tomorrow. Uh, I wish him luck on that. 
and there's some of the invertebrates which we which they see obviously if you've got a lot of gammas then that's really important for the quality of the stream and the, and it gives you a good indication on how healthy it is case caddis caddis and mayfly and other things we recorded blue winged olives olives yeah, we do stream improvements. Um, not that there's too much improvement on there, but we, yeah, we we allow the reeds to grow up. That's good cover for a lot of uh, mammals, etc. Uh, on this one, we built this with tarka as a couple of groins to to sort of speed up the water to take it down a little bit. But this is our outlet stream. This is nothing to do with a chalk stream. This is just an outlet stream. It does look in areas like a chalk stream, but it's not a chalk stream, but it actually has the same sort of invertebrates, et cetera, as the uh, Hill Hill Brook. Before COVID, um, I used to have an awful lot of children visit this, you know, from different schools. And what we used to do is because this farm, the way the fence is here, it's sectioned off from the farm, so there's no, no problem with health and safety issues. I used to generally uh, sit the children down here and talk about watercress, which they weren't always that interested in. But I used to spice the job up by having the hawk and the owl, which I used to fly for them. So that was spurred a bit more interest than watercress. But after I've done the watercress, it's left to the Hampshire Wildlife Trust. And they usually have people like Susan Simmons come down. And uh, we used to take them in this, in the Pill Hill Brook here and do invertebrate samples etc we've got uh, piles of wood where we do bug hunts uh, and butterfly counts etc with insects and everything else really and so when they did the water samples we used to put the gazebo up um, especially if it was a little bit damp we used to do the samples on there and the children used to look at them through um, magnifying glasses etc and, and do a count which was Excellent, they used to have an excellent day. Yeah, other things we do, obviously, is the, the bumblebees and the butterfly surveys. Uh, I've had moth nights where we caught moths and then the next day um, we had a visit from, I think this was a, a village, another village visit. Now COVID's obviously disappeared. Uh, the chances are it might not be me, but uh, someone may take on hosting more school visits on, at the farm with a focus on, obviously on the environment. Um, and I've been doing that since 2016, but obviously I've had uh, a two or three year break because of the COVID issue. Yeah, I think it's important, uh, certainly from the farm excellence point of view, is we need to get it out there, what we're doing and tell the public, public um, how we're trying to regenerate uh, the environment on our all, on all our farms, not just the watercress farms. I think it's important that people are aware that farmers are not here to to ruin the planet. Uh, we're here to grow food alongside the the wildlife, basically. And uh, hopefully, you know, people who who take the job on after me will, will will progress and succeed in whatever the company wants to do with farm excellence. And it is it is really important, certainly to me anyway. And yeah, we're we're, we're always looking at ways we can in, increase the wildlife habitats around the farm. I'll put a close on that there. There's about an eight minute video of things we've done uh, caught on camera at the farm over the last few years. So hopefully this will go well. Let's have a go.
Again, thank you very much for everybody who signed up and listened to me. Uh, I hope it's been interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs>